Dear God in heaven, we thank you for all your blessings. Uh, God, as we try and understand your word, uh, the messages that you have for us, and the events that are taking place in front of our eyes, help us to correctly understand them. And please um, be with us now as we look back into history, the past, and help us to understand how you operate and how you interact with your people. Uh, please send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our discussion. Uh, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm, I'm hoping if everyone can see the board clear enough. Um, so what led me to present to present this um, was Elder Parminder's most recent presentations. Um, and uh, if you, those of you who have seen them, um, there was a, a complexity when looking back in the 1860 uh, or 1850 time period where the sins of Babylon were slavery However, uh, when you go back to spiritual gifts, it also identifies as worship and the Sabbath being um, a significant, uh, the, the, the problem that's going to get you in trouble during the time of trouble after the close of probation. And so that, that, that caused me to go back and to review some of those presentations of Elder Tess's and so that's brought that 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 took us took me back to um, the 2019 School of the Prophets um, in France, and it was presentations number 39 and 40. But I wanted context, so I actually went back and I looked at. Um, 34 and 35. So that's what I'm going to be reviewing today. And between 34 and 35 of that school, um, between 34 and 35, what, what I'm going to be talking about today, which was, which is the two subjects, the dispensational reading and equality. Then it goes into number 36, principles of dress. Then 37 was a review. Then 38 was wearing pants. And so that was that history, that time. And then it went to 38, uh, 39, which is the sin of Babylon, which is what Elder Barminder is, is, was referring to recently. And number 40 was the Sunday law. So not only am I reviewing, so that's the context. So I'm sort of going back to the beginning of that context um, in that school. And I'm also bringing in uh, Brazil 2020 um, in February, which is presentation three, five, and seven, which is basically a continuation of the theme of what Jacopi was talking about, which was um, the Omega of ancient Israel. It's basically um, nailing down that line. So that's, that's what brought me to this place. I've already, uh, I, I accept that we're not going to get to any um, conclusions today because um, probably time and where it's going to be more of a, a review and then the next time we will bring in application a bit more and and draw it together to bring it back to what Elder Parminda was talking about more recently. So let's let's kick off and we are dealing with the end of ancient Israel, so the Omega. That's what this line is. Or we could say this is the history of John, the disciple. That's John, the disciple's line. Um, now, one thing I want to put in place straight away is 
the line of the end of ancient Israel proves our current line. It's not the other way around. So when we draw the line of modern Israel and, you know, the 144,000 line, which is the same, we just got to remind ourselves that that was there first. This end of ancient Israel proves um, the 144,000 line. Um, so let's start. We'll go, we always start at the end of, end of ancient Israel. We know it starts with the birth. I might just rub that out and just say John. Anna. I'll put 144,000 in brackets. But we know it starts at the time of the end. And that year was 4 BC. And, and that, that was the birth. The birth of who? I've heard a whisper of Christ already. John the Baptist. And Grace. I'm going to say... I'm going to agree with both of you and say both. It's only six months apart. That was, that's right. That was six what? months apart. Um, and the reason is the time of the end, you've got Christ and John the Baptist. They were six months apart. They enter their work, their ministry at the ages of 30. So John the Baptist started his work six months before the baptism okay so and then christ was identified and so you can't really separate the two um first messenger second messenger so we're going to put the births of john and christ we'll put john and christ which brings us already we can see the link between here and here already so we've got the baptism. Um, 27 AD. And this is where the arrival of the second or the second messenger comes. So Christ comes into history and he starts uh, his process. Um, now let's go to the end. Does everyone just remember the second advent Weimar? What's it? Isle of Patmos? Yes, thank you, Ray. Isle of Patmos. And if I, I'm just going to read 19 MR 40.4. Bear with me, it just skipped away. In the days of the early Christians, Christ came the second time. His first advent was at Bethlehem when he came as an infant. First advent. His second advent was at the Isle of Patmos when he revealed himself in glory to John the Revelator who fell at his feet as dead when he saw him. But Christ strengthened him to endure the slight sight and then gave him a message to write to the churches um, of Asia. Okay. So second advent, Patmos. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Now let's go to Acts the Apostles. I'll share screen for this one. Five six nine. Sorry, bear with me. Five six nine point one. Okay. John lived to be very old. He witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem. Mark that. 
and the ruin of the stately temple, remember that as well. The last survivor of the disciples who had been untimely connected with the Saviour, his message had great influence in setting forth the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. No one could doubt his sincerity and through his teachings, many were led to turn for unbelief. So this is... John has already gone to the world here. He's witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Um, now let's read the next bit. The rulers of the Jews were filled with bitter hatred against John for his unwavering fidelity to the cause of Christ. Um, so then they're angry with him. Obviously, they're concerned if he's still around, his influence will continue because he was the last live known connection to Christ, the Messiah, and that whole model. So let's go to point three. John was accordingly summoned to Rome to be tried for his faith. Here, before the witness, uh, the authorities, the apostles' doctrines were misstated. False witnesses accused him of teaching sedici seditious heresies. By these accusations, his enemies hoped to bring about the disciples' death. Okay. So we've got seditious, so we've got sedition and heresy. And actually, we might read the next bit while we're there. Um, he gave a testimony, but they wanted to silence him. John, and then if you go to 570.1, John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. But the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant as he, is, as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. Okay, we'll stop there. So we've got a few things going on here. John witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem. And temple. And that was 70 AD. He also he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil because of the accusation of sedition and heresy. Heresy, which is what Jesus was accused of also. So, and that because of that accusation, because of the sedition and heresy, there was a death decree against John. Okay. There's also uh, another quote, SL 41.2. So what we just read there in Acts of the Apostles, um, 469, 470, that basically compares John in that history at the time of trouble here, actually, I'll say during that history, and it compares John's experience in that history to the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. And then you go to another quote like SL 41.2, and that will compare the fiery furnace or the three Hebrews to the time of trouble after the close of probation in the 144,000 history, which is identical line to this. So, what I hope you can see the loop there that. Um, the time of trouble for John equals the time of trouble for the three Hebrews equals time of the trouble for the 144,000. Okay. So what's missing? We've got two way marks at the beginning. We've got two way marks at the end. We've got 4 BC, 27 AD, 70, uh, 70 AD and 100 AD. What's what's the what's the one missing? The middle way mark. Middle way mark. Exactly. And what happens at the middle way mark? Yeah. Sunday law way mark. We'll call it Sunday law. But what happens at the middle way mark? No. Close the probation of all Jews. Yes. Good point. We'll get to that. Yes, what year was that? 
34 AD. Where'd you get that information? Where, how do you know that 34 AD so many weeks of determined upon my people? All right. <laughs> so I want to point out here that this is where, which ties into what was just said a moment ago, where this is where the close of probation occurs for the church, for the Israel nation, the, the, the Jews, God's people. But also this is the moment where God's message goes to the Gentiles. And the question was, well, where'd you get that information? Um, because if you're a Jew living in that history, if you're Jewish, say you you make saddles or you make chariot wheels or something and you're living your life, you're living here, you're walking through this history. How do you know where you are? How do you know what's going on? How do you know um, how do you what where do you get your warning? What's your warning? You're walking through that history. How do you know what's going on? The book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. And what? where would we find that? I think that was Graham. The prophecy of 490. Daniel 8. Daniel 8, 25. So what we'll do... Um, we've all got to pretend we're an Israelite in that history and we need to figure out what's going to warn me or each of us to figure out what's actually going on up here because there's lots of problems we just don't know what they are yet um, so let's go to Daniel 8 Quickly. Now, at this time, I should have said this at the start, if everyone could just grab a Bible or uh, a device that doesn't interrupt the whiteboard, because what we're going to do, I'm going to get everyone to follow through with the verses, and I'm just sort of going to paraphrase as you actually read the verse, and we're going to plug all these things in, because we need to know, as an Israelite living in this history, how to how to um, decipher what's happening correctly. Okay, we'll, we'll start with Daniel uh, 8, 13. Um, I will actually just read this. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long is this vision? that has just been explained in all the previous uh, um, verses concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary or God's method of saving people and the host or God's people, how long uh, are they going to be trodden underfoot? And then the answer comes, well, unto 2,300 days, then will the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay. Daniel has no idea what that means. So all I know is that we've got 2,300 days there or years. Um, so Daniel has no idea what that means. Um, only until he asks for forgiveness um, for his transgressions and that of his people because they kept doing the wrong thing. Um, they weren't keeping, amongst other things, they weren't keeping the Sabbaths. And that's code for they were oppressing people. They weren't treating people properly. Um, in other words, one, uh, uh, the elite or a group of people were downtrodding and oppressing um, another group of people. That's basically code for that, amongst other things. So... This is not an in-depth study of this. There's too much to go through, but I just get the the theme as we go through Daniel 9. And when, da when Daniel, yes, please forgive us for all that. Please forgive me for my part and my people. We've done the wrong thing. 
Gabriel says, okay, now I'm going to explain that vision that you didn't understand before, that 2,300 day thing. Um, and, and then Gabriel's basically going to give Daniel understanding. And so if we go to um, verse 21, you can see there's Gabriel. Okay, I'm going to come and give you understanding. Um, verse 22, basically going to tell Daniel, I'm going to explain it to you. 23, um, and what's D Gabriel going to explain to Daniel? The vision that you didn't understand before. And then Gabriel's going to break down that 2,300 year thing. And so if you're a Jewish person in that history, um, 2,300 years doesn't really do much for you. It doesn't really help you that I can see. Um, it's only when it's broken down into detail can they actually reference, put put themselves on a, I don't want to say on a line, but I'm going to say on a, on a time frame that they know where they're at. And so only when this understanding came to Daniel and it was broken down, can you start grasping where you are in history. So verse 24, you can read the actual words. I'm just going to paraphrase and use my words. And this is a, not an in-depth study of this either. So 70 weeks or 490 years are cut off for the Jews and the city. And, and that, that, that 490 years is cut off from that 2,300 year prophecy. All right, I'm gonna draw that. But remember, we don't know at this point, we're only at this verse, we don't know when it starts, but we know that 490 years have been cut off. So here's our 2,300 2, year thing. There's the 2,300 year prophecy. 490 years have been cut off. That's not enough information yet if I'm living in that history. That's fine. I now know that there's a probationary time for God's people, um, the Jew Israeli nation. Um, that's all I know. So verse 25, now we're going to verse 25 because we need to now break down, well, what's the 490 about? That's not enough information either. Um, so verse 25, when the commandment goes out to restore Jerusalem, which is 457, so we can put that in. That's when the commandment went out. To Messiah, so the Messiah is coming, um, shall be 69 weeks. Okay. 69 weeks. All right, how many, where's my little? So we've got 490 years, but when the Messiah comes, it's actually going to be 400 and 83 years. Okay. And that's also broken into two sections because you need to build the wall and the streets. So that's this bit here. I'm not going to talk about that at the moment. But that, that even 483 is split up a bit. So four, so that's where they build the streets and the walls. Um, okay. So we know that the Messiah comes here. And sometime after the uh, 69... 
uh, weeks or the some at some time after the 483 years, sometime after this period here. By the way, we can work that out now because we know 483 years from 457 gives us 27 AD. So we'll just put that in. So now we can start putting the puzzle together. So sometime after 27 AD, um, this is verse 26, sometime after 27 AD, or after the 483, or after the 69 weeks, the Messiah will be killed. And the people of the prince, or Rome in that history, will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. So when, okay, so you now know that you're starting to see this way mark happen. Um, but they don't know when that's going to happen, but we know that sometime in the future, I'm just going to put the date there because we know in retrospect. <clears throat> um, so sometime after 27 AD, uh, where am I? The Messiah will be killed and the and Rome will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary in the future. And he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. So he, the Messiah, so the Messiah comes here, confirms the covenant for one week or seven years. So one week, seven years later brings us to what? Mm -hmm. By the way, you already know it's 34 because of the 490. 490 years after 457 brings you to 34 AD. So we already knew it was that, but now you can see it interlocking. The, the, you're getting more information that's just zeroing in on this detail. 27, uh, when the Messiah comes, going to confirm the covenant for one week. Um, and in the middle of that week, he will cause the sacrificial system and the sanctuary requirements to stop. To stop. So in other words, it splits the week in half. So not only this seven is also split in half with more detail. So... Is everyone okay with that so far? The rest of the verse takes you beyond that to 1844, because that's the 2300 day prophecy. Takes you to October, October 22nd, 1844. Um, so that the, the rest of the verse continues on, but where we're in this history. Um, is everyone okay with that so far? So they didn't have a reform line that, like we know it, but they sort of did. They yeah. sort of did. Um, they had way marks, measurable way marks. So based on time. Um, let's go to Desire of Ages 234.1. The time of Christ's coming, okay, there's one. Time of Christ's coming, his anointing by the Holy Spirit, two. His death and the giving of the, his death and the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles, four things were definitely pointed out. 
in Daniel, yeah? It was the privilege of the Jewish people to understand these prophecies and to recognise their fulfilment in the mission of Jesus. Christ urged upon his disciples the importance of prophetic study, obviously referring to the prophecy given to Daniel in regard to their time. You know, who and then whosoever readeth it, let them understand. Um, okay. So there's four things. Four things. Um, we've got the anointing by the Holy Spirit. When was that? So this was pointed out. Yep. So that was number two. But we'll... um, anointed by the Holy Spirit, his death. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. Measurable by time. Um and the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles was also pointed out. Thirty four. Thank you. So th these were given, but what else was given? The time of Christ's coming. When is that? When's that? Get out of the Birth way. Birth for BC. Sorry? Could it be 4 BC? Yes. The time of... Yeah, the birth. But where is that in Daniel 9? Let me give you a clue. You're not going to find it. <laughs> um, so what, I'm, what, what Ellen White's pointing out here is if I refer to our time, we aren't the only ones creating a time of the end. 1989 is not found in Daniel 11, verse 40. We have to construct that. And so back then, they had to construct it also. It wasn't given to them on a platter. They had to logic through that because what did we start off with? We started off with John and Christ. Um, uh, Brendan, so yes. the prophecy takes us to Christ. It doesn't take us to Jesus. 4 BC is Jesus, 27 is Christ, and the prophecy is yes. about Messiah or Christ. Yes, thank you. Yes, you're right. You've got to get language correct because if you get your language correct, you'll get prophecy correct. So thank you. Um. So, and Messiah, Christ, that's right. Thank you. Ah, I've just thought of the implication then. So what you're saying is, they weren't, they didn't come up with 4 BC. They weren't interested in his humanity. All they wanted was the divinity. The divinity yeah. is Christ. The humanity is Jesus. Because when, when Elder Tess was explaining this, she was... Basic, and I'm just trying to reconcile what you're saying, what she's saying. So I'm, um, she pointed out that they had to construct the time at the end, and that's why the you know the you know the shepherds and and people like that were studying the prophecy. They didn't know exactly. They knew it was around that time. They didn't know specifically accurately, but they knew it was happening around that time because. They were studying these prophecies. Um, maybe I need to think about that more. Ooh. 
Okay. All right, is everyone if is everyone okay with that? So if you're in that history, you're trying to figure out where you are. If you if you read Daniel nine and you correctly understand it, you can sort of work out what's happening in that history. And a lot of it centers on thirty four AD. Um, so. Just lost me. Okay. So from Daniel nine, how many groups do we have? We know that. We have 34 AD and beyond. We know we have the Gentiles. But can you see, even within the structure of Daniel 9, the, the, the confirming the covenant for one week was also split in two. So without drawing the reform lines, even within Daniel 9, we can see a group here, group here, and a group there. So the first and the second groups were both Jewish, and the third group gathered were Gentiles. So this is a gathering of people. Um, so basically, a message came, we'll call it a a gathering or a cry or uh, an inf information came that tried to collect these people in this history, this group, and this group. Information came, they had to make a call. They had to decide what was true and what wasn't. Um, and that's before we've even gone up to the detailed reform line. Um So what was the final, okay, so let's go to this history. What was the final, what was the cry that called the world here? Yeah. Got three, you got People being called. So the call to be Christians was. So we're looking at specific way marks. Oh. You're talking about the story of Stephen. So that's 34 AD. So here you've got a group being called in this history between 27 and 31. We'll call them the disciples. In this history, 31 to 34, that was when it was Jews. But then they had to come together and begin a work. And then they went to the Gentiles. 120. And an event happened here that... The Roman army surrounded the city. Yeah, the city. So we'll call that 66 AD. I just want to point out, and this is sort of carrying on the theme from Jacopi, we want to know they've been, they've been given some information all along here to try and make a choice of what's going on. Um, there's lots of problems and that they need to fix the way they see their whole structure, their whole system, their whole government, their whole view of who God is. And so this is uh, a basically uh, each group being 
confronted with is this who God is or is this who God is? And so even back here, actually we'll get we'll we'll come back to that in a minute. So if we go to Desire of Ages 215.3. We want to talk about John the, the Baptist. Okay. In his mission, the Baptist had stood as a fearless reprover of iniquity. Both in high places and in low, he had dared to face King Herod with the plain rebuke of sin he had not counted his life dear unto himself that he might fulfill his anointed work. So John's got to work. And now from his dungeon, he watched for, he looked for the line of the tribe of Judah to cast down the pride of the oppressor and to deliver the poor and from him that cried and him that cried. But Jesus seemed to um, content himself with gathering disciples about him and hearing, healing and teaching the people. He was eating of the tables of the publicans while every day the Roman yoke rested more heavily upon Israel, while King Herod and his vile parama worked their will, and the cries of the poor and suffering went up to heaven. Okay, so here's John in prison, and what's John, there's a, he, his intention, John is struggling because he knows what, the Messiah is supposed to come and do. And what's the Messiah? What what does Alan White reference? Well, John is looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah. What does a lion do? Devours. Devours, destroys, subjugates, punches down and kills. Um, I guess I'll, I just want to simply put what this model actually looks like. Um, the model, if I was to draw it, would be um, here's Rome. Here's Israel. A lion comes and what has to happen? And where would they get that idea from? Can you see what I've done there? That's basically just the basic representation of the thinking of John and by extension, everyone else. They thought, and rightly so, because that's all what the Bible says. That's all the verses. That's all they've been taught. That's all they know. At some point, they're going to be restored to dominion, to the old ways. To And so when the line of the tribe of Judah comes, Rome is going to be subjugated. So this is on a corporate level. And so, in other words, restore Israel's rightful place in the scheme of the world, in, in geopolitical... Um, sphere. What would we call that today? Patriarchy. Yes. Think of just from a it definitely is patriarchy. That that it all ends to there. But if what about one world government? Yeah, from a national point of view. I just said it. From a, a country's point of view, you've got one country thinks that they're more important, have more value than another country. Nationalism. Nationalism. 
make America great because America is far superior and has more value than other countries or Israel or India or Australia or any country says that, can say that. So what that in that history, that that those people were being confronted with a test on nationalism. Is that did everyone see that? Mm -hmm. We'll get we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, my notes are all over the place, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, um, Brendan, if if Rome was ruling the world at that time and Rome was subjugated by, say, Israel, uh, then Israel will be the ruler of the, the world at that time. That nationalism, but also the government of the time. Does that equate or not? Just a question. So your question is, was Rome nationalistic? Is that what your question is, or did I understand? I was, I was, I was saying that Rome was ruling uh, yes. the world at the time. Okay, so if Christ came and subjugated Rome, then Israel will be ruling the world at the time. Uh, nationalism, as well as uh, a one-world government, would does those two equate? Can I think about that? Sure. I'm not so sure myself, but it just looks alike, but may not be. Well, well, I agree with what you said at the start. So essentially, they're looking for a Messiah to come, a king to come, a Messiah to come, and to put them back to where they rightfully are designed to be or where they, you know, because they've got biblical history to go off. Of course, there's prophecies in there that say that. Um, but again, are they reading very correctly? But um, I'll think, can I think about that and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. <clears throat> so nationalism was a test in that history we're going to go into that more detail. But between 2014 and 2019, nationalism was a test as well. They had to choose between Hillary Clinton, globalist, Donald Trump, nationalist. So it, that was external, internal. Also, the same decision had to be played out because um, the same model and even the final straw that broke the camel's back when FFA left was uh, it's based on this model where we don't want to have a model of elder prime minister saying we don't want to have a model of um, subjugation and just we want to have a model um, in other words a model like that where one is on top of the other and that that was sort of without going into that detail I'll probably confuse people now but i'm saying that that model of one group under the other was what sort of split ffa as well so even internally this nationalist model or this idea um was confronting and hitting this movement and that's why the world views came into question because you know well i sort of leaned towards oh, tr trump or this was back then because of the way they thought and it was nationalistic and so that's why the information stream was so important okay So a 
another way of saying, and I think Jacoby mentioned this, is it was a test on geography in this history. It was a test in uh, on geography in in our history as well. Um, and it was also a test of geography in the Millerite history as well, because internally you had um, they eventually got the time right with October 22nd, 1844, and they got that with the midnight cry. But their geography is wrong with the, um, which is what we just went through, that, uh, 814, the sanctuary being cleansed. They just got the geography wrong. This is in heaven, not on earth. And externally, you also had the nation of America confronting the same issues. Um, what's this country going to look like? Are we going to annex Texas? Are we going to take over and build a, um, a colonization? So they were being confronted and they were having big arguments of what their country was going to look like. Um, how we're, we're going to expand territories and behave a certain way and expect, by extension expand slavery and how's that going to look? So in each history, internally and externally, or even in the Millerite history, we're going to expand what, what's the kingdom going to look like? What does that kingdom, as we build it, what's it going to look like? Um, and that's the tension that we've been looking through and the tension you see globally, what's, what's the world going to look like? Is it going to be globalist? Is it going to be nationalist? Um, What's the time? Okay. Um. So coming back to this history, end of ancient Israel, Jacopi touched on it a few times. What were they, what, what were they supposed to learn here? Actually, let me go back a step. What do they actually want? What are they after? The Apis bull. <laughs> the Apis bull. Okay. So what does that mean? Uh, what do they want? What do they need to fulfill their deepest yearnings to fulfill prophecy in their world. They need a king. Why do they need a king? Why do they need a king? I'm in I'm an Israelite in this history. I need a king. Why? Why do I so why do I want a king? So I don't need to have kings. <laughs> Did you, did you just say, Molly, to subjugate the other king? Is that what I heard? No, I said they was just wanted to copy the other nation because of they had kings. Uh, yeah. Oppression. Why do, I, why do they want a king? We can about, we've got big problems. We can have an army. They, they need an army. They need a king to carry out this job. And so John the Baptist, he's wanting, like everyone else, a warrior king. We need a king. And what does a king do? Puts A king is going to put Israel there and Rome there. They're just going to have the same model, but just swap. Have the same model. Model doesn't change. You just uh, subjugate another group, a different group of people. Yeah, they just want an apis bull. Just yeah. What do we so? We've gone nationalism, but now bring that down to the individual level. Um, you've got a Roman and you've got an Israelite. What does the Israelite want to do to the Roman? Subjugate him. What do we call that today? Patriarchy or yeah. one race against another race. Racism. Racism. So back in this history, 
underneath all this stuff, you've got you got these subjects that are bubbling. And I'm not saying Christ, because you've got to remember these histories, it's broken into two. You've got civil and you've got religious. Christ came and said, I'm not dealing with that. Oh, this one. What what what's Christ trying to fix? We've talked about race, civil rights, because if you go back to Leviticus 25, and I like the way all the uh, tests have come in to explain it. They go, oh, I've got an Israeli passport. You get special civil rights. What about all the other nations? Do you get special civil rights? You don't get civil rights. So back in this history, under the government, you have Israel above, uh, we'll call them Gentiles. And by extension, civilly, what about women? What about women's civil rights? You're owned by the father, sold to the husband, and if your husband died, you transferred to the nearest male cousin or relative, right. whether it's a brother or so you don't have civil rights. So okay. So when Christ came, what's he setting up? Because this is what this is what everyone got confused. Everyone got so confused. Right. Everyone's there's three calls, three lots of data that's getting uploaded to these groups, <laughs> and they're being confronted with a decision. And it comes down to the model. Because you can see it in how, how do you become a priest in this history? So now we're going over to religion. To be born into the right family. family. Birthright. Yep. Actually, let, let's take one step back. Who can enter in? How do you enter into covenant? Mario. You have to be an Israelite. Start with. Different. You can be a man. You have to be Boy. male. But could you enter into covenant as a Gentile? No. Yes. What about circumcision? Yep. Yeah. And male. So if you were owned, if you're a Gentile and you were owned and controlled, you could be told that you're getting circumcised and you're entering into covenant with God. So even a Gentile male oh, is, yeah, is above, yeah. can enter into it. So now let's go to who can be a priest. And Catherine started explaining that. You have to be male. And worse than that, you have to be part of a certain bloodline, which is... Yeah. Levi. Levi. So you not only is it male, but you've got to have, be under a certain bloodline. So you come to this history that they're all getting tested on, and all of a sudden they start baptizing. Who's getting baptized? Men and women. Everyone's getting baptized. All of a sudden they're throwing away all established truth. Um, established doctrine or established verses, established religious doctrine. They're baptizing, so that deals with anyone. So all of a sudden, it's not just men, women, now everyone is equal. You, you've got uh, Israel, Israelite, Gentile. 
woman, man. Mm -hmm. Everyone has equal access to this kingdom. Everyone. In some ways, they're doing away with the law of Moses. So, what did we start off with this morning? We're just about out of time. We started off with the birth of John and Jesus. Even right back at the start, you've got the seed. You've got, why, is, why can John be a priest? As far as the priest. He had special blood. He, he, he had special bloodline. Why is Jesus a priest? What gave him that right? He had no right. Zero right. He's from Judah, not Levi. He's a male. He's a messiah. Huh? So <laughs> Jesus didn't have special blood, which was a requirement. He is... He, satisfied he was from the bloodline of. Oh, sorry, he he was from the tribe of Judah, and didn't he come from David's line as well? So he was in the bloodline for a king, not a priest, though. Which would also help yeah. to throw them. Yeah, but he came as a priest because he had to fulfil all the types of the sanctuary. So that's why he could only start his work at 30 years old, same with John. But even back then, this they're trying to... Christ, the Messiah, was trying to undo the model. The model of it's not about bloodlines because it got transferred from John because his father was a priest. It's not... you Entering into covenant is not based on your race your bloodline or your gender by extension. Um, so I guess I'm, I've got to wrap up now. Um, I'm hoping you can see where we're going because back in, even in ancient Israel, the subjects were embedded, yes, Christ was trying to undo the religious model and create a kingdom that wasn't literal. Um, it was building a new church. And the model of how that church operated is turned on its head. And you just know that moving forward, that if you change the model to equality here, you know that God's way of working thinks that if you're equal here, well, you have to be equal here. You can't just, um, but it's taken a long time for, because it was, a, the religious aspect was addressed, but not the civil aspect. Um, does anyone, I think we'll, we'll stop there. I just want everyone to see that the subject of nationalism was there. The subject of race was there, embedded. Gender was embedded. Um, and the Sabbath was all through that history as well. So I guess the first advent was trying to unravel patriarchy in the religious sense. I think that's what it's trying. I think that's what was happening. Um, and undo the, yes, the threat, you know, we've heard of the Apis Bull model and things like that. But when you understand what, what that actually, the model that it, it represents, it's all based on race and subjugating one one group to another group or one person to another person so i think that was trying to be fixed um in the beginning uh the end of ancient israel so let's um have a prayer and we'll close dear god in heaven we thank you for your 
help um, towards us. Um, we we thank you for all these messages. There's been so many, and help us to understand them more fully. Understand what you were trying to do, what you have been trying to do, and um, what you are doing now. Help us to um, enter into um, that and surrender to the process of entering into your kingdom. Help us to um, be a part of that group that actually helps you and not hinders your work. Um, bless us now for the remainder of this Sabbath day and we're grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen.